As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus! the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Palm Sunday. This is the celebration of when Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem and had a king's welcome. Uh, he was revealing who he was to the world. He was being recognized as the coming king and he fulfilled the prophecy of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. This is an exciting Sunday and I, and I hope you enjoyed the videos that we showed at, at the beginning. Uh, thank you for the families who submitted those videos. Um, thank you to my wife Heather who distributed the um, the palm branches to the different households. Um, so we're uh, we're we're not letting the coronavirus stop our uh, our celebration of Holy Week, which starts today. Um, Holy Week, of course, marks the, the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry, and it kicks off today, Palm Sunday. Uh, so uh, I hope that you enjoy the day. I know that this seems like a difficult and even bizarre time to be celebrating, um, what with the coronavirus and the increasing number of, of deaths related to the virus. But uh, the thing about it is the message of Holy Week and the message of Easter is that even in the darkest times there is always hope. Uh, when Jesus was greeted by that crowd as he entered the city, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And uh, Hosanna essentially means save us. And it was, uh, it was a recognition that Jesus is our hope. We're talking about people who 
faced oppression at the hands of a foreign power. We're talking about people who were suffering from crushing uh, poverty, where they didn't know one day to another if they were going to have everything they need, and they looked to Jesus as their hope, uh, source of hope and celebration. So as we are celebrating Holy Week in a way different uh, from how we would normally do Holy Week, um, I pray that you would keep in mind that the season is still on. We still have an opportunity to celebrate this season together and demonstrate not only to each other but to the world how we have hope even in the midst of the darkest times. Uh, before we continue with worship, I do have uh, an a few announcements this morning. First of all, uh, a reminder that the directory photos, which were originally scheduled for April, April have been rescheduled to August. Uh, you can contact uh, me at 812-585-2234, and uh, I will pass along the message uh, so that uh, we can get back with you and make sure that you get rescheduled. Um, I also uh, want to continue issuing my invitation to uh, all families, young, old, those with kids, those without kids, uh, who would like to create a video and send it to me um, to uh, 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 tell all of our viewers what Easter means to you, what its significance is to you. So create a video and send it to me. Uh, and just in case I didn't give you my phone number earlier, it's 812-585-2234. And you can also email it to me at andrew.baker at inumc.org. Now, if you're not really good with technology, if you don't really know how to do the video, First suggestion, uh, ask one of the younger people in your family. Um, I'm also uh, a pretty uh, a good tech guy. I, I'm pretty comfortable with technology, so give me a call and I might, might be able to coach you through it uh, over the phone. Um, but it would be a wonderful way to celebrate Easter to have all of your videos that we can get of you sharing what Easter means to you. Now, uh, I'm also going to have, as this is Ho Holy Week, I'll also have special videos that I'll be posting. Uh, one for Maundy Thursday, on Thursday night. Uh, Maundy Thursday is the celebration of the Last Supper, the institution of communion. Normally we would have communion on, uh, on uh, uh, the first Sunday of the month. Um, uh, unfortunately, since we're not meeting in person, that's not a possibility right now. Um, but uh, hopefully the video will be sufficient, uh, at least for now, uh, to help you recall how that practice of communion started and the important gathering he had with his friends the night before he was crucified. And then, of course, Good Friday will be the celebration of Jesus offering himself up as a sacrifice, as an offering to make up for all that we had done wrong in our lives and to bring about peace between us and God the Father. And then of course next week we'll have a, a special Easter video for you to celebrate as a family, as a household, the special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. I think that's all the announcements I have. Uh, as far as that goes, do want to share the financial report. Um, we're in a new month. It's April, uh, March. Uh, we, uh, you gave uh, over all, uh, about uh, well, eleven thousand six hundred ninety dollars and fifty-five cents, which is wonderful considering we are now on our third uh, Sunday of not meeting in person. Uh, so many of you came. Uh, 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 stepped up to the plate in the last week to give your offering either electronically or, or by postal mail. Um, a reminder that we do need uh, over $16,000 uh, a month uh, to meet expenses to fully fund our budget, um, but we, we do have some in reserve, so no need to worry too much yet. Uh, I would still, though, encourage you to continue giving normally 
uh, through the other means we have available. You can uh, send your offering to 95 West Franklin Street in Spencer, Indiana. That's our office address. Uh, you can also give online at these links on our homepage. Um, so check that out if you would. Now, if you would please join me in this morning's call to worship taken from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let Israel say, I will give you thanks, for you answered me. Let Israel say, I will give thanks to you, for you answered me. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it this very day. Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. You are my God, and I will praise you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Now I invite you to join me in worship as we are led in worship by our praise band consisting, uh, for our purposes, of Kathy Woodruff, Penny Carpenter, and Dana Coffey.
Jesus, we thank you for who you are. On this day, when we remember you riding a donkey into the holy city with a king's welcome, help us to remember the king that you are. The king that you were back then, the king that you are now, and help us to live in anticipation of the king you will be when you return. And Lord, we pray that during this holy week that we would experience you in a completely new way. We're all experiencing this week in a completely new way. And so, Lord, we pray that you would use these circumstances to speak to us, to speak to our hearts, to write your story on our hearts like you never have before. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I've been on social media a lot more lately. I, I'm i generally not posting a whole lot on social media. I do occasionally scroll through my Facebook feed, but um, there, there's a meme, I guess you could call it, that's been popping up on social media. And at first it was kind of cute, kind of interesting, but then it kind of took an absurd turn. Um, and it involves this scripture from uh, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Go, my people, into your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Now, the first time I saw it, I thought it was cute. But I think it was because I'd only read the th first three lines. I mean, okay, so, you know, uh, that, that that's kind of a cute way to tie in a verse from the Bible in with what's going on. Uh, and then the next thing I saw was that people were saying, hey, quarantine's biblical. Um, no, no, that's kind of tenuous. Uh, I mean, it's biblical to look out for your neighbors and the other people in your community, which is exactly why we're, what we're doing by uh, staying at home. But, uh, but then there was an even further extreme it got pushed to. People were essentially suggesting that what we're facing right now is the fulfillment of Isaiah 26.20. And even more, to even further, they were pointing to the, the scripture reference, Isaiah 26.20. I saw a post that said, ooh, today is the 26th of the month in the year 2020, and look what's happening. Okay, again, cute, but the the scripture reference is from the we, the scripture reference twenty six twenty. That was an organizational thing introduced by medieval scholars. Uh, it's uh, um, not original to the biblical text. The chapter twenty six verse twenty. Medieval scholars put that in there to be like, hmm. Let's have a convenient way to index and quickly find certain passages of Scripture. Let's break it down into sections called chapters and verses. Um, so to, to assign some sort of mystical, numerological significance to the Scripture verse is a little bit, uh, well, borderline superstitious. Um, that said, you know, I, I don't want to say that God doesn't uh, insert little quirky things like that into our into our lives sometimes to make a point. I just think that it's putting it a bit too strongly to suggest that that's definitely what's going on here. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are looking at the things going on around the world um, and saying, uh, you know, there were fires in Australia, there's a global pandemic, uh, there's... Uh, a, a locust swarm in North Africa, uh, is this the end of the world? And people are looking for, for scriptures that, 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 that they believe um, what we're facing right now is the fulfillment of. They want to say that, ooh, this is, this is the beginning of the end, or, or whatever the case may be. And we always want to be careful with stuff like that, because... Um, well, there have been plenty of cases in the past where 
predictions about the second coming of Jesus, which for us Christians is the big indicator of, of the end of the world or the, the end times or the last days, um, there have been times when uh, people have predicted even going so far as to assigning it to a certain day when Jesus was coming back. Let's look, for example, at this guy. This guy's name is Harold Camping. Harold Camping publicly predicted the end of the world as many as 12 times. In 1992, he published a book called 1994 Question Mark, suggesting that uh, in 1994 that Jesus was going to come back. It didn't happen. And so he also predicted that uh, it would happen in May, on May 21st of 2011. It didn't happen. He put. He said he miscalculated and pushed it back to October 21st, 2011. Uh, as you and I know, we're sitting here in 2020, and it didn't happen. Uh, and and supposedly the way he figured out when the second coming was going to be is he uh, believed himself to have figured out that uh, that that particular date was the 7,000th uh, anniversary of the the flood of Noah from uh, the book of Genesis so um, didn't pan out um, William Miller uh, we're, we're traveling backwards in time here William Miller uh, began preaching in 1831 and he attracted as many as 100,000 followers he predicted that the second coming would happen in 1843 didn't happen so he revised his estimates to 1844. Didn't happen. Um, then there's uh, jo Joanna Southcott. Uh, she had as many as 100,000 followers, and she claimed that she could hear supernatural voices that helped her predict the future. And she announced in 1813 that she would give birth to the second Messiah, that that would be the nature of the second coming. She would give birth and that child would be the second coming of Christ. Um, she was 64 years old at the time, by the way. Uh, and according to Britannica Encyclopedia, she died before the baby could be born. Uh, that's all they say, so that's <laughs> all I could find on the, on the matter. So. But, um, so, th those are extreme examples, but there's a, there are all kinds of misconceptions out there, even, <clears throat> excuse me, even within the Christian community about what the Bible has to say about the end of the world or the second coming of Jesus. And, and the first myth that I want to address is that the Bible maps out a precise timeline of the end of the world. There is uh, there's this idea out there, particularly about the book of Revelation, that it gives us a literal play-by-play -play timeline of events that lead up to the second coming. And the reality is most biblical scholars don't believe that. Um, there are as many as four main schools of thought in, in understanding what the Bible has to say about the last days, the end times, the time leading up to Jesus' second coming, and it's actually an extreme minority who believe that uh, the Bible gives us a precise timeline. It actually tends to give us more generalities than, than a specific play-by-play. -play. And um, the, the school of thought that believes that it originated in the 1800s. It's actually a very new way of, of understanding end-time prophecy, and it's one that is largely not believed in in more scholarly circles. Um, here's another one for you. Uh, well, this isn't a myth so much as uh, something I want to share with you. I've got another myth here in a minute that I'd like to address, but this is what I do want to spell out. Regardless of which of those four schools of thought you fall into, here are the things that gen generally Christians agree about the, the end of the world according to the Bible. Biggest thing, Jesus is coming back. He, he died, he came back to life, 
hung out with his friends for a few weeks and then departed this plane of reality to go to heaven. Uh, he's there uh, until the time is right for him to return. When he comes back, he will raise the dead. Those who have died will be raised to life just as he was in his resurrection. Uh, he will then judge the world. He will, uh, he will decide who will uh, inherit eternity and who will be condemned for eternity. And then finally, um, Jesus will bring the faithful into a new era of peace and of eternal life. Um, the Revelation calls this new world that Jesus will establish as the new heaven and the new earth, the new universe, so to speak. So these are the things that uh, Christians generally agree on. The more specific you get, the more divergence there is. This is basically what all Christians believe, uh, agree on. Now I get to the other myth. And this is the one that I really want to focus on this morning. There is a misconception out there that the Bible says that catastrophic events like wars, famines, natural disasters, global pandemics uh, are the signs that the end is upon us. And uh, that's simply not the case. The Bible actually says the opposite. The Bible warns us that these things are going to happen, but clearly tells us in and of themselves they are not the sign of the end of the world. The Bible warns us that, look, these things are going to happen, but just because they're happening, don't think that the end is coming. And I want to take uh, a look at, uh, we've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, I want to take a look at what is known as the, the Little Apocalypse. The, um, it's a passage from the Gospel of Matthew. It immediately follows the scripture that we looked at last time. It's one of Jesus' final public uh, addresses. Now, he's left the temple courts by now. You will find him leaving the temple courts here at the beginning. And it is a conversation he has with his disciples. Um, but it's one of the last teaching moments he has before he's, before he's condemned and crucified. Uh, before he gathers with them uh, the night before his crucifixion for the Last Supper. This is one of the last teaching moments before that. So, um, it's in Matthew 24, and this is the scripture. Let's look at it together. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? he asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So Jesus makes this prediction that the temple courts will be, will be leveled, will be torn down. And in response, uh, this is what happens. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, it's worth noting that they're asking him two things. They may not have realized they were asking him two things, but they were asking him two separate questions. When will this happen? In other words, when will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When will you reveal yourself to the world as the Messiah? When will you bring about your earthly kingdom. Now in their minds, they may have thought that those were one and the same, but you and I, looking back on history and Jesus, who who was aware of the wholeness of, of the divine plan, um, we know that it's actually a two-part question. Those are two different issues. When will the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign of the end? So then Jesus answers their question. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is yet to come. 
Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. So the point in this passage is not that these things are the sign of the end. The point is that they aren't the sign of the end. Jesus is saying, look, these things are going to be ha are going to happen, but don't worry. I didn't come back and you miss it. I didn't reveal myself and you miss it. So when these things happen, these wars, these these natural disasters, these famines, these mundane catastrophes, they're going to happen. Don't worry. The end hasn't come yet. That's Jesus' point here. And so when we see these things like a global pandemic happen, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sign of the end. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Now, uh, so, but what we should take from this passage is that we shouldn't be surprised when life-altering things happen, when, when disasters happen. They're going to happen. It's, it's just an inevitability about this age. And there's another thing that should not surprise us while we're waiting for the second coming. He says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, we Western Christians, especially we Christians in the United States, because our persecution is subtle and, and not... It's, it's a stretch to even call it persecution, um, considering what other Christians around the world and throughout history have faced. We're actually pretty cushy here in the United States. Um, so for us, often this description seems like some dystopian future, but it's been a reality for Christians in certain parts of the world in certain seasons in history, all of it. Uh, even Christians betraying each other, Christians love growing cold. Matter of fact, I see that happening here in the United States. Um, so this is sort of a summary statement of what the experience of the church will be during the time between Jesus' Jesus's first and second coming. And uh, then he answers the other question. So far he's been talking mainly about the question of the end. Now he's going to switch to that other question, what, when will the destruction of the temple take place? And he says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, the let the reader understand, just a side note, that's probably an insertion that uh, Matthew makes. Uh, Jesus didn't likely say, let the reader understand. But anyway, um, and Jesus is, uh, when Jesus refers to the abomination that causes desolation, he's referring to a prophecy from the prophet Daniel uh, who uh, predicted um, that a political leader would um, desecrate the temple, that he would religiously, spiritually defile the place of worship of the Jews. And most scholars, including myself, believe that that prophecy was fulfilled when a Greek leader by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. I could tell you more about that, but that's just the, the gist of it. And so what Jesus here is saying, and he, Jesus is speaking generations after that happened, he's saying that something similar has yet to happen. And it's going to happen in AD 70 when the Romans completely sack the city of Jerusalem and dedicate the temple and, and tear it down, destroy the temple. 
That happens in AD 70, 40 years after Jesus makes this statement. Uh, and so Jesus is answering their question, okay, when is this going to happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And Jesus is, is talking about that right now. And he tells them, let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. So he's talking about how difficult it will be for the Jewish people uh, during that season. And in, in, indeed it was. They endured violent persecution. Um, the last holdouts uh, took their stand at a place called Masada and ended up um, committing mass suicide to keep themselves from being captured. So it, it got ugly. Um, pray that your flight will not take place in winter on the Sabbath. And then Jesus transitions to talking about not just what happens right around the destruction of the temple in AD 70, but he goes back to talking about the whole period of time between his first and second coming. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. And that's a summary statement of the whole season. He's, he's talking about how much strife there will be in the world during what we now know is a 2,000 year period of waiting for Jesus to come back. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, that's you and me, those days will be shortened. So um, it sure seems like it's been a long time to us, but um, God's going to bring the, this season to an end at just the right time. And now we get into talking about the end times. Up until now, we've been talking about this whole season that for us has been the last 2,000 years. But now he's going to talk about what happens before Jesus returns in answer to that other question. Um, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the west, uh, sorry, from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. So the, the point of all that is, the second coming is not something we're going to miss. It's going to be obvious. Um, and, and, and so don't worry so much about natural disasters and global pandemics. Those aren't the signs of his coming. Um, it'll be obvious. It'll be obvious when Jesus comes. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So we're, we shouldn't be concerned about extraordinary but mundane events. What should get our attention are things that are not mundane, things that are clearly supernatural. There's nothing clearly supernatural about the coronavirus. It's just a very virulent uh, new virus that, that we have needed to take some time to slow the spread of so we can learn about it. Um, but no, it's the exceptional things, the clearly supernatural things that will be the indicator of Jesus' coming. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great authority. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. So what we're seeing is clear demonstrations of the supernatural culminating in Jesus himself appearing and calling together the faithful. Those are the indicators that Jesus is coming back, that, that the end has come. Not earthquakes, 
not natural disasters, not famines, not global pandemics, but clear supernatural demonstrations leading up to Jesus himself appearing and gathering the faithful. Now, uh, then he says, Truly I tell you, this generation, referring to the generation who sees uh, these, these uh, clearly supernatural disturbances in Jesus' appearing, will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So uh, the, the people who see uh, those things happen don't need to worry because um, it'll, it'll, all, it'll all work out by the time all is said and done. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and give, being given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. So when Jesus comes back, it will be unexpected. Those those crazy supernatural signs in, in, in the heavens will make it clear what's happening. But it's going to be unexpected. So this notion that certain indicators point that it's right on our, that Jesus is right on the doorstep about to come through, or this notion that we can calculate the day when Jesus is coming back directly contradicts what Jesus says. Jesus says, look, you don't know. You don't know when it's going to happen. You, it, you'll recognize it when it does, but there's not going to be any way to anticipate it. So, um, and then he says more on that subject. That is, yeah, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now, this is a statement about the the judgment you remember earlier i was saying that christians by and large agree that when jesus comes back he'll raise the dead and he will uh, judge the world he'll judge all the people of the world and so he'll sort out sort people out in, in judgment and that's what's being indicated here therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your lord will come but understand this if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then, and this is, this is the practical application of all of this, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he is not aware of. So, in all of that, the message is this. You don't know when it's coming. You don't know if, it, if Jesus is going to come back during a global pandemic or during a season when things are all sunshine and rainbows. You really don't know. There's this idea out there that there will be this... Um, it'll be obvious that Jesus is coming, and it'll be obvious when it happens, but not in the time leading up to it. It, Jesus could come back during global, periods of global strife like we're facing now or during a season where things are, are fine. We really don't know. And so we need to be prepared to be faithful in any circumstance when things are good and when things are not so good. And, and if you get nothing else from this message this morning, those are the two things I want you to get. First of all, bad things are going to happen. Bad things happen in this world. And they don't necessarily indicate that the end is near. They don't, that doesn't necessarily mean the end is not near. But it doesn't necessarily mean the end is near. Mundane 
realities like a pandemic or an earthquake or whatever else you associate with the end of the world they're not the indicators the indicator that the end has come is clear supernatural displays in the sky leading up to Jesus making his appearance and calling his faithful to him that is what indicates the end and so when we face things like this we shouldn't panic we shouldn't think that it's that the end is upon us frankly the end could be upon us anytime we don't know so on the one hand don't assume that when things uh, bad things happen in the world that the that that means that the end is near or not but be ready at any time for Jesus to come back regardless of our circumstances good or bad we should choose to be faithful whether it's the end or not whether things are good or not we want to be that faithful servant who is going about our master's business when he gets back from his uh, trip so that's my message for you today let it be well with your soul let you remain faithful and obedient to God both in good times and in bad whether or not Jesus comes back tomorrow and he could Jesus very well could come back before I'm finished with this message but that's why we need to be ready at all times in good times and in bad we shouldn't be looking for signs of his coming because guess what by the time we're seeing clear signs of his coming it's at the door so be ready at any time to face Jesus be going about every moment of your day doing what Jesus would be pleased to see you doing let's pray Jesus we thank you that we have the hope that you will one day come to see us that you will one day come to make your home with us in a real way you will turn our world upside down in the best sense and Lord that day could come at any time you make it clear that there are all sorts of catastrophes that might happen along the way that will endure hardship and persecution but those things alone are not the indicator of the end the indicator of the end is your physical return to the scene you'll return you'll raise the dead to life you will gather your faithful to you and you will separate those who will face eternal life and those who will face eternal death and you will usher in an eternity of peace safety security and plenty let that give us hope but let that also caution us not to get up get caught up looking for signs of the end but to be prepared every day of our lives to meet you in jesus name amen my hope is that uh, you will find peace for your soul. And to that end, I'd like to close with this hymn, uh, a classic, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet though trials should come 
Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord O oh my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul and lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. And now as you go about this week, may you find peace even if the world is in chaos. And may you be ready any day, both in good circumstances and in bad, to meet the Lord Jesus face to face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.